Thank you. Um, welcome to the December 6th Neshoba Regional School Committee regular meeting. I'm calling the meeting to order at 6 o'clock. Um, we've got kind of an odd agenda tonight and some really big business to take care of. But I'm going to flip a couple of things on this agenda. We do have a guest speaker coming. The old one. The choral group won't be here tonight, so we're going to ask them to come on the 20th, which actually will be nice right before the holiday break. Um, I'm going to flip the school committee chair updates and the citizens' comments, and I'll explain why I'm doing that in a minute, um, because I believe we have folks here who want to speak. Um, how many people have a citizens' comment that they would like to make? One, two, three, four, five. Okay. So I'm going to, uh, we'll get there. All right, so first to the school committee. Um, reminder on January 20th, that's our budget workshop, and hopefully um, the public is obviously welcome to come to that. Um, during the past couple of months and in through December, we've been listening and having presentations from the administration and their specific functional areas in order to help us understand what their thoughts are about where they need to take their part of the organization and what they'd like to do, what some of the challenges are that they're having. We haven't talked about um, budget dollars at, in those because we really want to understand the need from the student's perspective. And when we get into that workshop, that's when that the money's going to start to be discussed. And then for the next two months, we'll have those discussions. But right now, we want to understand what the need is. Um, Remember to check the calendar for updated agenda topics because it's still moving and changing. And um, I'm going to ask the school committee to remember that when the speaker, whomever the speaker is, has the floor, to please allow them to speak without interruption. And then I got a request from um, a parent who said that she's having a hard time listening to some of the, um, the meeting recordings because she keeps hearing somebody click their pen. So just an FYI, I can see how that would be distracting. Okay, and um, the last um, the last thing on my update before we get into citizens' comments, and I took the time to write it out this afternoon, so I'm going to read it. Um, it feeds right into citizens' comments. Um, the school committee has a standing practice, and we do, if any of you watch our meetings, of not taking public let me finish this before you react, of not taking public comments on any subject that's not on the current meeting's agenda. <clears throat> okay. But we know there are a significant number of people who are concerned about a vote that was taken at the last meeting on the pre-K program. At that meeting, there was discussion about waiting to take the vote and the school committee felt strongly that they were ready to move based on the recommendation from the experts in the administration and the vote was taken. Um, I realize that there are a lot of people in attendance tonight. Respect the fact that you took the time to come out. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to deviate a little <coughs> bit from our practice a little bit because I, we're not going to get into this habit and I'm going to take two comments tonight. However, I'm also going to put this topic on the agenda for the December 20th meeting. And at that point, I'll take additional comments, OK? All right. Um, we've received a lot of correspondence about the vote that was taken. Um, as I think there's some information that's out there that is correct and uncomfortable and frustrating. And there's a lot of information that's being circulated that is incorrect and uncomfortable and very frustrating. So that's why we're going to bring this back to the school committee to have the discussion in open session. At the same time, I'm asking the superintendent to prepare a document to be able to be used and sent and delivered to the community to answer those common frustrations that are coming to us because they're there's common themes that are coming to us. They're all very similar. I do realize some of them are cut and paste from an original email. I respect that. That's fine. But we're going to get that information out to the public through the administration. And then we'll take, um, we'll have the administration come back in 
speak to some of those issues. We're not going to have them read the document. We're going to have them speak to some of the issues and um, at our next meeting. At that point, I will allow more time for public comment. One of the things I want you to understand is it's really difficult for, for people when they start watching these meetings and coming to these meetings because you want to have the dialogue with the school committee. And I understand that, and so does every other school committee in the state. But that's not what we're here for. It's citizens' comments. It's public comment. It's for you to come and tell us what you think, okay? Um, what did I miss here? Um, all right, some of the things that I know we're going to ask the administration to respond to are what happens when the current pre-K students hit the second year? They have, a, they have another year in the district because there's a fallacy out there on that. Um, what happens when a new pre-K student wants to enter the program? We'll have, dis we'll have her discuss that or <coughs> her administrative team discuss that. And then I think something that's really important for everyone to hear is this new program or this uh, adjustment to the program is going to be put in place. What are you looking for in order to evaluate it so that changes may, could be made the next year? Um, I do believe that the school committee feels strongly that this was done for all the right reasons. Um, and I do understand that people have concerns, so that's how we're going to handle that at the next meeting, okay? All right, so given that, now I, I will take two comments, but let me just go through the typical thing that we go through. We've got policies that govern public comment um, with the school committee, policy KE and policy DBEDH. -E um, we have about... 10 minutes on the agenda for that. Each comment can be three minutes. I was only going to take two, and I'm, I have a really close friend who is a, a counselor to me in this vein. He's probably going to beat me if I take more than two, but I might. We'll see how it goes. Um, I'm going to ask that people who have not come before the school committee before have an opportunity to speak first. So show me your hands on those who would like to have to make a comment. Okay, you and if we could take you, and then if we have more time, you. You've, you've been before the committee. I know I've been before, several. but I thought I wasn't that, sure. I was unclear that's okay. the question was yes or So <laughs> why don't you tell us your name and where you're from, and then we'll give you, and I know it feels rigid, but the, the three minutes, okay? Yeah, no, um, my name's Megan Johnson, and I'm a resident of Stowe. Uh, my son, Thomas Anderson, is currently in Miss Kitty's classroom. At the center school. Uh, just a little piece about me is I have worked in early childhood as a mental health specialist for the past, I don't know, 10, 15 years. Mm -hmm. um, and part of that, uh, being part of a, being a mental health consultant in a school at a pre k program, I was a consultant. I'd go into the classroom and kind of look what's going on and making sure that everyone's social emotional needs are being met. Um, whether they're a, a, a typical developing student or if they're a SPED student, really doesn't matter. So when I heard that this stuff was kind of rumbling around and what was going on, I was definitely concerned. You know, first and foremost, for the idea that we really, you know, pre-K and early childhood is really about fostering great relationships between the children, between the children and the teacher, and also the school committee and the school district and the parents and the families. So I was a little, just in the way this has all kind of come together, taken aback um, about the communication piece around what was going on, because um, this is our first experience really working you know, with the school district, and we want to have that trusting relationship that I don't feel comfortable in at this, at this point. I want to be able to repair it and move forward, and I'm really thinking everyone else here wants the same thing. Um, when we're thinking about um, fostering these relationships and social emotional development in children, we're thinking about consistency of care. You're not going to find a standard anywhere that is not going to say consistency of care is for the utmost importance for your children when they're learning at this age, and especially attunement and attachment to the teachers in the classroom. 
So if we really are concerned about making sure the SPED children are getting what they need, what they need are interactions with other children that are consistent and are fostered and attuned and there's good attachment. And these relationships we'd like to see, I know, go on and be making a part, having a community start now so these kids are supported throughout their entire, all of our kids are supported throughout their entire community um, being in the center of school and going forward in school. Also, part of my job being <coughs> a head start was I was in charge of retention and recruitment of all the students. So I understand how hard it is to make the budget work. And I really do sympathize and empathize with the decisions that you do have to make around that. I do wonder about how the budget came to be. I do wonder about why is it that cutting the role model slots, which seem to be supporting the offset of the cost of having the, the sped, sped kids not filled, those slots not being filled. I kind of want to know what kind of community strength and needs assessment was done about what are our needs? Who needs what? what? What kind of programs are best for the community that we have at large? I know no one contacted me the past few years that my older child was on the wait list and didn't get in. No one said, hey, what are you looking for? Like, th why is there this wait list in one minute and the next minute there seems to be empty slots? That seems to be um, ridiculous to me. I don't know why that's happening. So I would like to know where that all kind of came from. Um, so I guess All right. All right. And it's Megan, right? Yeah, Megan Johnson. Thanks. I really yeah. appreciate your comments. And I appreciate your comments coming in. I think it makes us feel really supportive. Good. Good. I'm glad. Mm -hmm. Hi. Hi. Can All you right. tell so us your name and what town you're from? Sure. So I'm Kim Karn. Um, I'm from Stowe. And I have uh, two daughters that are impacted by the decisions that were made in last week's school committee meeting. Um, due to the time constraints, I wrote something down and I'm going to read it, so I hope that's okay. Um, the integrated preschool program, as it was mentioned in the meeting, was designed to provide children with disabilities free, appropriate public education in the least restrictive environment. According to the DEC and the NAEYC, the desired result of an integrated preschool environment is to provide inclusive experiences for children with and without disabilities, including a sense of belonging and membership, positive social relationships and friendships, and development and learning, all to reach their full potential. This is what the program was truly designed to do. I have a child on an IEP that I am grateful is able to access the preschool and its program and services. However, I also strongly believe that an integrated program is the right solution for my younger child who is typically developing. The integrated preschool program serves to foster the ideas of tolerance, developing empathy, and gaining an appreciation for the diversity of one another's abilities. Why should we be greatly limiting access to such a great resource? By drastically cutting the enrollment of typical students, that opportunity has been lost for them. There was also mention in the meeting that there are comparable programs available in the area. However, there are not. Integrated programs are inherently different in many ways. Instructor, instructor to student ratios, education focused around academics, behavior and tolerance and understanding, and a more comprehensive and audited curriculum, to name a few. The area programs are not designed in this way. Additionally, the two programs, at least available in Stowe that I know of, are at or nearing capacity. The displacement of typical students in Stowe alone exceeds the available spots in these programs. So now some children are going to have no opportunity for school at all. I see another big flaw in this plan as it pertains to students that the cuts are trying to help, children on IEPs. With the proposed changes, there will be no lottery for incoming three-year-olds. So no typically developing three-year-olds will be allowed to enter the program. However, three-year-olds that are on IEPs will be enrolled as they age in. There will be no peer models for these kids. Therefore, the program no longer meets the definition of being an integrated preschool program because there are no suitable peers for the children on IEPs. The program change as of this afternoon also now impacts students currently enrolled. They must re-enter the lottery and are not guaranteed to be with the students or the teachers that they fostered relationships with over the last year. Transitions are difficult at any age, but as the parent of two toddlers, I know just how greatly transition can impact their overall view of their personal security. I understand. Thank you. Three minutes. Okay. 
How much more do you have left? Uh, three sentences. Go ahead. Okay. Thanks, Kathy. So Appreciate I understand it. that we're trying to impact fewer students in the future by displacing more this coming year, but there must be a less abrupt transition model. So basically, as you can see, there are numerous concerns that I personally have with how the program is being implemented. Thank you. Um, and I urge the school committee to reconsider the reduction across the district. So All thank right. you for your time. Thank you. Thanks for um, sharing that with us, Kim. OK. Could you give us your name? I said two, and now I'm going to get beat up when I leave this yes. room. But two and your, I'm sorry. What's your name? I'm Erica LZ. Okay. In, I'm uh, 29 Water Aquatic in Bolton. Okay. Yes. All right. So I have a three-year-old who is in the integrated preschool program. Um, as you know, the primary purpose of the integrated preschool is to serve as special education students. However, I'm concerned that the changes in the class composition ratios would negatively impact the very students the program is designed to serve. The proposed changes would increase the ratio of special education students to regular education students to the maximum allowable limit by the state. and goes against policy recommendations by the U.S. Department of Education, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, the Department of Early Childhood, and the NAEYC, which is the organization that credits the pre our preschools. These organizations all advocate the principle of natural proportions, which means the percentage of special education students in an integrated preschool classroom should be representative of the percentage of special education students in the general population, which is currently at approximately 15%. The program that was voted on at the last meeting places the percentage of special education students at nearly 50%. Special education research does not support this change and in fact supports the opposite, the reduction in the ratio of special education students in relation to regular education students. The special education preschoolers are the most academically vulnerable population in the entire district. I urge you to please re reconsider the plan and ensure that the program structure is evidence-based and follows the public health and educational policies put forth by major governmental and private organizations. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. Okay, so I'm not going to get into too much more. I'm going to also share with you that anyone who has a concern about this, if you haven't talked with your building principal, that is really the first place you should go. And it's not because the school committee doesn't want to hear the concerns. We do. Your building principles are the reason why the recommendation was made to the school committee along with our director of pupil services and they are the reason why the school committee listens. They're the experts. I'm not an expert. Kathy spent her years in uh, her career in education. She doesn't have all of those um, certifications and education. They're the ones that you need to talk to to ask them why they made the recommendation they did. We own the vote, and that's absolutely the case, but I really want everybody, there is, um, there is this undercurrent of us against them, and I'm gonna encourage these communities. These are your kids, these are your kids' schools. The, you know, we, we don't do this because we like to get, we like to get into arguments, or we like to, look just at dollars and we don't care about the education. I wouldn't waste my time doing this if that were the case. <coughs> and everyone else sitting around the table feels the same way. It's not us versus them, you guys. So please, when you have questions, instead of listening to a small group of people who have intentionally cut the school district out of any communication, ask your principals, why did you want to do this? What was it that compelled you to give that recommendation? Come to the school committee. You can ask us, why did you, Lorraine, why did you vote that way? And I will tell you why I voted that way. And yes, I do wish we had waited a bit, but I do believe in the program itself, and I do believe that we need to readjust what was completely out of whack that wasn't focused on the students that were the most needy. Does it mean it's going to stay this way all the time? No, they've said they're going to reevaluate and adjust. So please, this is your school district. We get that. But it's not us against them. And we've got a long way to go, guys, 
between now and the end of the budget season, we want to do the right thing. We want to hear from you. Make it constructive, please. And I promise you, I'll make sure that everyone here is constructive, okay? All right, I'm going to stop now because I've, had a, I've, I've done enough. Probably way more than I should have. Can I say something? Y yes. I, I just want to piggyback a, a little bit. Uh, you know, we've had a, a number of communications come into the office, um, certainly, you know, through the superintendent or to the school committee and the superintendent. And a, a couple of things because you brought up the principals. First of all, I, I would make a general statement. I would say almost 100% of the, the communications that have come in have been thoughtful, articulate, um, respectful, all of those really good things. And so it, it makes it easier for us to respond back. And very often when you go through, you can see where the errors are, uh, you know, as you're reading through it. Th this paragraph's not right, that one. And so there have been times in the last 48 hours where we said, you know what, um, Principal Shea will probably be the better person to respond to that. Or Principal McCarran has said, let me take that, you know. And it's like too much to put in an email. I'd rather speak to this individual. And we've done that because they already have a pre-existing relationship with you that we might not. So please don't think that we have pushed the buck off or anything. We haven't. We just feel that if you, like I said to, to one individual today, and so we felt that it would be better for you, or Lancaster actually, to talk to Principal Shea because you might be more comfortable to ask the <coughs> questions. And maybe w as you're talking, you'll think of other questions, and we want that. So I just want to spring, ba uh, spring back from what you're saying. And again, I thank you so much because the communication has been so respectful, and, and I'm so appreciative of that. So thank you for doing that. I need to talk. Because Excuse me, I'm sorry. We're talk. in the middle of a public talk. meeting. You're out because of order, I sir. Have, I'm I don't sorry. You know what? I feel I it's important. We need to take what you just said, I appreciate it. I'm going to recess. recess. Six twenty-four. Um, I think it's time for the superintendent's report. I think so. Um, oh, how are you doing? I'm great. All right. Yeah, I'm great. You good? <laughs> yes. Okay.
Um, I hope that the parents that are here stay for the vaping and jeweling presentation. You do want to hear that. Isabel, what do you want to share with us? I have lots to share this week, so uh, the holiday season is upon us. Um, for athletics, uh, the football team lost a battle with Melrose in the MIA Division IV state championship game on Saturday the 2nd at Gillette. Uh, the team played tough and never gave up, and it was an overall great experience for the team and the entire Neshoba community. The band, cheerleaders, football team, and the fans all really enjoyed it. Um, winter sports are up and running, and games and competitions will begin this week. Um, from the music department, we have a lot of concerts, so um, get out your calendars. Uh, yesterday, the Foreign Sawyer School presented its winter concert for the fourth and fifth grade choir. And this Thursday, the symphonic band will be spreading holiday cheer at the Solomon Pond Mall from 7 to 8.30 p.m. in front of J.C. Penney. This Friday, December 8th, uh, the high school um, music department will be having a field trip to the Symphony Hall to listen to Boston Pops perform their holiday concert. Also on Friday, Luther Burbank Middle School will be presenting its winter concert for the middle schoolers during the morning hours that will feature 6th, 7th, and 8th grade bands. On Monday, December 11th, the Hale Middle School will be presenting their winter recital at 7 p.m. in the Hale Auditorium. On the 12th, the Burbank Middle School will be presenting their music concert at 6.30 in their auditorium. It will include uh, bands, the jazz ensemble, and the choir. On the 12th, Florence Sawyer Middle School Choir will have their concert at 7 p.m. And on Friday the 15th, the high school music program will pre be presenting a combined band choir concert. Uh, the concert will begin at 7 p.m. and tickets are $5 and can be bought at the door. It will be the first time that the band and choir students will be performing together. So I'm very excited about that. Um, on the 19th, the Florence Sawyer Bands will have their concert. And on the 21st, the high school music program will hold its annual concert for the Councils on Aging. It's a great opportunity for students to play for our senior citizens. And following the concert, our music students will have time to talk and meet the guests. Um, I've participated in that and very much enjoyed it. Also looking forward on the 22nd, Luther Burbank Middle School Jazz Ensemble will be performing for their honors breakfast beginning at 6.45 a.m. Uh, the other news from the school is there will be a blood drive sponsored by the Best Buddies on September 16th at the high school from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. Uh, through the Boston Children's Hospital, direct blood donations to their program, which is excellent, and sign-ups can be found online. Isabel is a senior at the high school. Yes. Your um, grace within the current situation is much appreciated, and I think you're an example for many. Thank you very much for that report. Okay, um, superintendent's report. I just have two quick things, and actually I'm going to kind of go back after the Super Bowl, too. Um, thanks to everyone involved with the Super Bowl game at Gillette Stadium this weekend. It was just amazing. Um, it was a great experience for everyone, and I, I stood there with um, uh, Brian Cote and uh, Paul D. Domenico was there, and, and Tony Rich, and I said, you know, when you stand here and you look out, it was a great fan base there. The cheerleaders were amazing. The band was amazing. It was a great football game, and it, it just, it just got no better. It just was no better than than standing there and watching it all unfold. It was just amazing and cool. Um, it felt so badly for our quarterback, who, as you know, got injured. Like I think it was a third play in the game. But you know, as I was standing there, Casey um, Cool, who was our SRO, was standing up there, and I, I was looking over, and I thought. I could have sworn she had a jacket when she came into this game. And I was watching her, and she just had a light shirt on. And I looked over at our quarterback sitting on the bench, and it dawned on me that he had a jacket on. So I went over, and I said to Casey, I said, where's your jacket? And she said, I gave it to Sam. And she's like this big, and he's like this Sam's big. Sam's big. <laughs> I mean, so broad shoulders, one yeah. shoulder. <laughs> but I thought, you know, again, it just, it's moments like that you're just so proud to be part of this community. So um, hats off to everyone. And I said to Sam, you know, I, I appreciate I said, I felt so badly. But, you know, I'm so appreciative of the fact that he helped to get the team there. You know, it was just it was just awesome. Uh, the only other is a second item I have, and I know that um, uh, both uh, Mr. Grant is here and, and Mrs. Angulo, and so I just want to mention the fact that uh, after a lot of discussion the last uh, last couple of weeks, we had decided, and, and it wasn't a difficult decision, but we decided that you know we've got a grade one group right now that's presenting a number of different issues that we thought, you know what. We've got people moving in. We have nobody moving out right now in that particular grade grouping. Normally, you have some transiency in and out in all of your grade groupings across the district. But right now in Bolton, that, that didn't happen. And so we took a look. We had a lot of discussions. We talked about a, d a lot of different alternatives, whether we kept the, the classes as they were and bring an additional aid in to each class. I mean, we looked at everything. 
And at the end of the day, the administrative team looked at this and said, you know what, we think it would be better if we opened up another classroom. So just as a, a bit of an update, by w means of an update, we interviewed Monday and Tuesday. Uh, reference checks were being done today and tomorrow. And then uh, Friday, Mr. Uh, uh, Principal Bates will send out another update at that point in time, say here's where we're at. We have the class prepared. Uh, here's likely, we're hoping that by Friday we'll know who the teacher is. If not Friday, probably Monday. And so if, if it doesn't go out on Friday, it'll go out on Monday with the, t with the name of the new teacher. And next steps to make sure that there's a smooth transition. Um, this was done with a lot of discussion with the grade one teachers, the current grade one teachers. So it wasn't something that was just kind of picked up and just kind of uh, the decision made in, in a vacuum. That's not all what happened. So I know that Mr. Grant is here and Mrs. Angulo are here, so if anyone in the audience has any questions that they'd like to ask them, not, not now because it's not an item that's on our agenda, but certainly feel free as they, they go out in the hallway, if you've got some questions you'd like to ask them, feel free to ask them. So uh, that's it for my report. So um, thank you for that. And I think um, there's also a common theme of, of um, communication process. Um, we're going to work with the administration to make sure that that's a little bit smoother and clearer and the lines delineated because while I really respect what you're doing with the grade one, I think there's been a lot of confusion and frustration about that as well and the communication to the parents to let them know it was coming and just a lot of questions that we couldn't answer, Neil and I couldn't answer. So we'll, 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 I'm thinking about that. I'll come back with something on that. Um, What's that? Had, had you thought about how you're going to distribute? Like oh, yes. Okay. All right. So that's not on our agenda, so I don't want to get into a discussion mm -hmm. on it, and it is a bold specific issue. Um, okay. So we have a guest speaker. I'm going to try. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and Casey, Chris we're also going to ask Casey Hool, our, our Hi, SRO, Casey. to come Thanks up and, and um, help us out here, too. So um, Tina and Casey actually had presented to our administrative group um, maybe two meetings ago, and they just did a great job. And I had spoken with Chairman Ramosco about it because it, it's an area that um, there's a great article that we read today that talked about the fact that this is one of those kind of subversive things that's going on right now in, in our society, particularly in our schools. And we just thought it was a really good thing to put bring forward and say, you need to know this is a bigger problem than, than maybe you m might suspect. And I think one of the, the great things, nice to see you again, one of the great things that, sh that she brought forward um, is very specific things for us to take a look at. She had very specific um, vaping tools that she was able to share with us so that we could see what they looked like. And I can see that she's got them here tonight too. And Casey was able to kind of chime in and help us uh, to understand. And so the administrative team, I think, got a, a lot out of that presentation. So when I talked to Chairman Ramosco, she had suggested we bring them back in, and so we're delighted that you're able to come and join us tonight. So thank you very much. Sure. So hi, everybody. Uh, to th uh, thank you so much for having me back again. Uh, thanks to the school committee. Um, I'm going to try and be brief because I know you have a, a full agenda tonight. Uh, hello to everybody uh, in the audience, parents. Um, I'm especially glad to hear see that you're here tonight because uh, it's really hard for me to get in front of parents, so the fact that you have some parents here tonight is really awesome. My name is Tina Grisowski. I coordinate the Central Mass Tobacco-Free Community Partnership. It's a grant-funded program at UMass Medical School from the Department of Public Health. We work to reduce smoking and secondhand smoke in Central Mass, and there's people who do my job all around the state. Um, the main reason as um, I was here asked to come because of the concern around vaping. I'm sure all of you know and have heard around um, electronic cigarettes. The kids call them vape pens, hookah pens. So I have a brief presentation in general about tobacco prevention for a youth. And um, I do have some materials that I passed around. I have more if uh, you all want some in the back. There's some in that box if you want to get them out for people. I didn't bring enough um, flyers for everybody. Um, but the um, title of this um, presentation is just that, Big Tobacco Targets Kids. I don't have to tell you all um, that about the industry and how insidious they are. Pointing to, all right, that's over here. There you go. Um, <laughs> so, um, 
that's me, this is my contact information, I have some cards here tonight. And if you all, as parents, have other uh, groups of people that you'd like to um, have me come and speak to after you hear this uh, presentation today, I'd love to come. Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, church groups, a uh, group of parents that you are friends with, neighbors that you have in your house, I'd be glad to come and talk to them. We really trying to educate um, parents around this, around this issue. So what do we know, especially about uh, youth, adolescents? I don't need to tell you all that uh, adolescents, uh, we know now from science and MRI, uh, the, last, uh, the last part of the brain to develop in adolescent doesn't continue to develop fully till age 23, 24. The last part of the brain to develop is the prefrontal cortex. If you have middle schoolers, you know that um, the brain isn't developed because that part of the brain is responsible for um, planning, organization, responsibility, um, the good decision making, good decision making, which is a lot around this topic. So, um, as I always say, when your 12-year-old um, is running out the front door to catch the school bus at 6.45 in the morning with a piece of toast in one hand, a backpack thrown around the other, baby shoes tied, hair done, that's a good day, right? That's a good day because middle schoolers are all about learning how to plan and organize and make decisions. So what do we know about nicotine? Nicotine <coughs> is the drug, you all know that, that's in um, tobacco and in the vape and um, e-cigarettes. Nicotine is addictive, um, and especially for young people, young brains, it forms a pathway of addiction because the brain hasn't finished developing. So if you introduce nicotine early into the brain, it's much more easily to get addicted than if you started using nicotine when you're in your 20s or late 30s. We know often that youth that tend to experiment and then use nicotine uh, are often kids who already have some issues with self-medicating because they are feeling depressed. They may have issues of uh, neurological challenges, ADHD, ADD, they may have trauma history, they may have parents who are going through some issues at home, there may be some stress in the family. And um, uh, often kids uh, self-medicate with the nicotine because it kind of gives you a buzz. If you've been a smoker, um, I won't get into smoking right now, but if you've been a smoker, nicotine gives you kind of a little bit of a high or a buzz. So um, we know that um, it's harder to quit using nicotine if you've started when you're a young adult. Um, I mean, a young, a young teen. We've interviewed and worked with people who are my age in their 60s, 70s, and 80s who started smoking when they were teenagers, and it's much harder for them to quit because they started smoking early. So this is just kind of all background. So what does the industry know about this? The industry knows that young teens are impulsive. How do they make decisions about trying new things? Well, they look to see what the latest Snapchat was or what's new on Instagram. What did their friends do yesterday? What did their grandmother tell them? Maybe what did their mom say? The day before, what did their best friends say? So how do they make their decisions? And it's not until we're adults, like all of us in this room, that we really know how to organize our thinking and base our, our decisions about experience. So the industry counts on impulsive activity by youth and um, makes products that are sweet, cheap, and easy to get. <coughs> the sweet part is the flavorings. Nowadays you can get um, bubble gum, cotton candy, grape, cherry flavored, uh, small flavored cigars, I'm going to pass, pass some of them around to people, chocolate, um, flavored, grape flavored, 69 cents, two for a dollar. These are the flavors that young people today um, are growing up on flavored cereals. Young people know flavors, okay, in this country. Flavored cereals, flavored jello, flavored yogurts, and to top it all off, if you have a young child with an ear infection, what do you go to CVS and buy? Flavored. Medicine. Flavored what? Medicine. And what is the flavor? Cherry. Cherry. <laughs> what is even more the flavor? Bubble gum. Mm -hmm. Any two-year-old in this country knows bubble gum flavored amoxicillin if you've had strep throat, if you've had um, an ear infection. So the flavoring disguises the taste of tobacco 
and it makes it appealing for young people. Um, I'm sorry, I'm having this tonight. Um, so these are these are some of the flavors in the electronic cigarettes, the vape pens, and um, one of the strategies to to limit the access to these products is called the flavor restriction. So towns, through the boards of health, have the ability in Massachusetts to, back, to pass local regulations. So um, over 100 towns have passed the flavor restriction regulation. This is not a ban. It uh, restricts the sale of all these flavored tobacco products to an adult-only establishment, like a tobacconist, if you have one in your town, or a vape shop. If you don't have one of those in your town, then they're not for sale at all. So it removes it from the convenience store, the gas station, the pharmacy if you have one that sells, and um, the grocery stores. Cheap. So these products are cheap. Um, a pack of cigarettes today in Massachusetts costs uh, at least $10, $12 for a brand name pack of cigarettes. All these products are taxed less because they're made out of pipe tobacco Pipe tobacco is cheap, and um, one of the products that you may have seen that's flavored, uh, this is chewing tobacco. I'm sure most of you have been familiar with chewing tobacco. The baseball players have always used it in the past. They don't so much anymore. High, high nicotine content. Um, baseball players now you know, chew sunflower seeds and bubble gum. So the industry, <coughs> and most, Teens in, in um, Massachusetts and in the United States know that chewing tobacco is not good for you. They've seen baseball players with cancer of the throat. They've seen the, um, all the ads for, um, for the dangers of it. But what, so what the industry's done instead is they've packaged it up in a little tin that looks like Tic Tacs, Altoids. Uh, if you're an older generation, you see the camel, you know what that stands for. Um, and they've taken it, they put it in a little pack of tissue paper so that it doesn't produce the saliva and you spit out, which is gross and disgusting, that, that the chewing tobacco does. So uh, you can pack this in your lip, get the nicotine, and then throw it away. So if you were a teacher or a parent, you probably would not notice this so much in a backpack. That's one of the um, products that kids are getting a hold of. It's called Snooze. Um, so what, do we, what can we do about these small flavored cigars? Another regulation that the Board of Health can put into place is called the uh, minimum sales um, restriction. Instead of these cheap single cigars, the stores have to package them four or five in a box like this and has to cost at least two fifty or up to five dollars so that you're eliminating the cheap um, packaging, the cheap um, single flavored cigar. So more than 150 municipalities have passed this now. Um, we know that increasing the price uh, of tobacco in general is the way you get people to quit smoking. The biggest public health success besides vaccines in this country has been reducing the smoking rates. They've done that because of raising taxes. You can see a, a simple slide here that shows from 1992 when the taxes were raised on cigarettes, the numbers of packs sold have gone down as they've increased the price. So teens are really sensitive to price, and um, driving the cost up of these products is another way to limit the access for tobacco. So easy to get is um, where can you find these products? Mostly in convenience stores, gas stations, pharmacies that have not had a restriction on them, or your local grocery store. So one of the things that I'm sure that you are familiar with are the vape pens, and the old vape, vape products were started maybe seven, eight years ago. You got a kit in the mall. You went to a mall, cost about $100 for a kit. They were mostly made for helping people to not smoke regular combustible cigarettes on an airplane or in a work site. Well, um, that's completely changed now. Um, now they're aimed uh, mostly at young people. 
these are more traditional vape pens. Again, lots of flavoring. They have a cartridge in them of nicotine. The nicotine is in an aerosol <coughs> solution called polypropylene glycol, which is kind of an oil-based like spray pan. Now what you're gonna hear is that it's just water vapor. And if you talk to your kids, um, they're gonna tell you, I just use the healthy ones, the cherry ones. There's no such thing as a vapor electronic cigarettes or a vape pen or hookah pen. All the solution is a polypropylene glycol. And um, so what happens to the polypropylene glycol? I'm gonna pass these around. So these are old, sort of old school. And the cartridges uh, are like triple, little AAA batteries. You also have a AAA battery in there. You turn it on and it heats up the nicotine um, and you inhale it and you exhale it and it looks like smoke. High nicotine content and then you have the flavorings, okay? Kids think that they're an alternative to smoking, a healthier alternative to smoking, and are they uh, less harmful than regular combustible cigarettes? Sure, regular combustible cigarettes are burning tobacco, produce tar, you all know that from years of um, public health experts you know, telling people around the science of tobacco, we know that it's bad for you producing carcinogens. The thing about these vape pens is that they have lots of nicotine in them. What's the problem with nicotine? Well, nicotine is a drug that is a vasoconstrictor, so it constricts your veins and your arteries, and it raises your blood pressure, and it makes your heart work really hard. So we don't want kids, right, using nicotine products because it's not good for their bodies. So if kids tell you that they just use the healthy ones, the education that I'm uh, suggesting that you pass on to them after you hear this tonight is that there is no such thing as a vapor electronic cigarette. Now, how do we know this? The problem with these, all these products is that they're not regulated. As bad as cigarettes are for you, the FDA regulates cigarettes. They know what's in each one. They have to test them each week. If, a, if Marlboro wants to put out a new kind of cigarette, they have to go through all this testing and FDA approval. These products do not have to go through FDA approval because the industry has sufficiently lobbied against the FDA to make sure that these have not been regulated yet. They've tried. They got really close when Obama was in. Um, as soon as Obama went out in January last year, FDA came right in with the new chief and they've put the uh, halt on any kind of FDA approval of these kind of products. So um, you can go online and buy these the makings for the vape pens, which people do, and uh, put it all together and go out on um, Route 117, open up a little shop and sell them yourselves. So what are kids doing? What kids are doing is that they're um, getting gift cards. You guys give your kids gift cards? Sure, you go and buy the Visa gift cards or your mother or father send your children gift cards or your sister or your brothers send your kids gift cards. So kids have gift cards. And what they can do is they can go online and buy these products um, and uh, you, they ask for the age, but all you have to do is click the little thing that says you're over 18, and then they can buy the products online. So it's easy for them to get. In pharmacies and convenience stores and gas stations for youth, when they can buy tobacco products, it sort of sends a message that it's normalized to be able to buy products in the gas stations or convenience stores, because you can go in there and buy your eggs, right, or a carton of milk when you go fill up for gas. So in a kid's mind, you know, tobacco's okay, it's sold right in the same kind of stores as where you can get them, milk and eggs. So um, the pharmacy ban is another local regulation, prohibits the sale of tobacco in pharmacies. Um, now over 100 um, communities have passed this regulation. CVS has already made this as a policy nationwide. So. Uh, please go support CVS to get your prescriptions filled. Don't go to Rite Aid, don't go to Walgreens, <laughs> go to CVS. Um, so we know that um, e-cigarettes are more used by youth than by adults these days. 
And if you look at your um, youth risk behavior survey, which you are lucky enough to be in a community that does the youth risk behavior survey, self-reporting survey by your kids telling what they do, uh, and they report, you know, up to 40% um, in Massachusetts are using vape pens and cigarettes on the big tobacco targets. Kids brochure on the back is a, a couple of graphs that tell, share this information. And you can get your local data from the school uh, department here, we'll tell you. So, um, the e-cigarette juice, as I was talking to you about, this is the liquid that goes into the larger um, e-cigarettes that ca called tanks that you can buy at a vape store. Uh, they're a little bit more expensive. You don't usually see kids um, using the bigger ones because they're more expensive. But what you are seeing now and what um, your wonderful SRO here uh, brought to the um, principal's meeting last couple weeks ago is the newest form of electronic cigarettes. The industry has come up with the ultimate um, device to use for kids. So what does this look like? Flash drive. Thumb drive. Thumb drive. This is a jewel. This is what all the kids are buying now. Most of you buy them online with a gift card. And I think she can pass one around to show you. This is the main um, component of it. And then you buy these little pods, jewel pods, with the flavoring in them. And you stick it on in. And then you just you know, turn it on. You charge it up on the laptop or on the computer. So if a youth has one in a school, in a backpack, sharing them around, you, you can't really tell. So what we say is that this is responsibility of the industry, of the retailers. Kids are kids. They're at the cutting edge of everything. So they're always going to find the things that is newest. And they're going to experiment with it. So we just want to make you aware of this. So tonight you can go home and you say, oh, I went to this committee and there was this really wacky woman there and she was talking about this thing called a jewel jewel pen have you ever heard of something called a jewel pen and they'll go oh yeah everyone's using the jewel pens so um, what we say is uh, educate yourself um, talk to your kids about it look around see what's in your community, and um, you can talk to your local boards of health. Uh, Lancaster, Bolton, Berlin, boards of health are working right now on updating their tobacco regulations. It's a time where you can um, weigh in on it if you want. Um, we have letters, um, you know, template letters if you're interested um, that you can use to write to your board of health to support these kinds of regulations. Or you could just call up your Board of Health yourself, or maybe you know somebody on the Board of Health and, and talk to them about the, the regulations. I would, I, we really just encourage parents to learn about this, to make sure you talk to your kids about it. And the main message, again, is that um, nicotine is a drug that's addictive, and um, it's not harmless, and um, there's not just water vapor and cherry juice in the, um, in the vape pens. Tina, any you, questions? You had mentioned about the oil with the administrative group, and, and maybe you could just expand on that a sure. little bit with this group, too. Sure. Because I think you stopped short of just finishing right, right, that right. thought. Thank you. Yeah. So what is in the vape pens is the polypropylene glycol. So polypropylene glycol is the, is the aerosol oil. And most people, if you've heard about it before, you may have heard polypropylene glycol. It's in potato chips. It's in a lot of other foods that we eat. And uh, it, we digest it because it goes through our stomach, and our stomach has lots of acid in it, right? So, but what happens to the polypropylene glycol that we're inhaling when, when you use the vape pens is it's going into the lungs, right? And the lungs are moist, and um, we know that oil and water don't mix. So what's happening to the oil? It's not getting digested like in the, in the stomach. So the latest research shows that um, it's starting to build up in the lungs of people who've been using the vape pens for two, three, four, five years. And it's starting to cause you know, uh, respiratory infections, pneumonias. It's starting to create a syndrome, which you may have heard related to microwave popcorn, <coughs> called 
popcorn lung. So back, I don't know, seven or eight years ago, they started looking, uh, they started hearing about people who worked in microwave popcorn factories. Mm. And the chemicals that were coming off the microwave popcorn were starting to cause infections and respiratory problems and the syndrome in microwave popcorn uh, workers. And they started to call this, when they looked at the lungs, it kind of looks like a bumpy um, uh, surface to the lungs and they named it popcorn lung. Well, now they're starting to see the same phenomenon happening in the lungs of people who've been consistently using the, the vape pens and the e-cigarette products. There's, a, there's the polypropylene glycol and then there's the flavoring. So the flavoring is di diacetylene, diacetylene, you can look it up, D-I-E-T-C-L-Y-N. And um, the newest study that just came out, I can send it to you as well if you're interested, is that in mice, the diacetylene, um, they, you know, put, had mice use uh, nicotine products with flavorings and nicotine products without flavorings. And the mice without the flavorings um, were okay. The mice with the flavorings, even with no nicotine, were developing syndromes in their cells that are like cleft palate and a couple of other anomalies. So the, even the flavorings, um, we, you know, people are start, uh, having questions about the flavorings. So, you know, the main message is know what your kids are using. We know the tobacco industry, right? We all know the tobacco industry. It lied for years. It's still lying. It only is beholden to its shareholders. It's only to make money. It's traded on the New York Stock Exchange. And they'll do just about anything to keep nicotine uh, as a... Um, you know, a, a substance out there until they can get people hooked on it, and young people especially, and this is how they're doing it. Great, Tina, thanks. Um, Casey, is there anything that you're here that, that we need to add, or she pretty much hit on everything, I think? She hit on a lot. The, the main thing is that with all the vape pens, they all have a heating device, so with the heating device, it's going to heat up. You can add um, dabs, which have THC. You can add THC oil into the uh, devices, and you can also burn regular marijuana in the devices, which are a little bit larger. It heats up and it, you still get a little puff of smoke, but it's a lot less potent, where you're not gonna immediately smell it like that. So it's a lot harder to detect, and that's a big issue with the vape pens, because you can obviously turn it into smoking marijuana, which is a big issue. Um, but what I handed out is, um, this is from Detective uh, Abeo from Westford Academy. Obviously, it's not unique to, to Bolton schools. Um, he put together these two, two notes, um, one to the parents, one to the faculty and staff. I also attached the MA rules um, and consequences, as well as our handbook from Neshoba, which, which pretty much covers everything. It's really in-depth. It says, uh, in addition, NRHS also pr provides, uh, prohibits possession of any tobacco products and non-FDA approved nicotine delivery devices such as e-cigarettes, hookah pens, or other tobacco products in schools. Um, so I think that's really great because we're very proactive on preventing this stuff from coming on campus and, and um, really trying to nip it in the bud. Great, thank you. So I have a question for you. So this was sent out by the Westwood Academy? Yes. And so we sent, I must have. I can um, alter this and change this to, to fit Neshoba. Um, this is just a template that I grabbed from Westford Academy. I can certainly create one that we can send out to faculty, staff, as well as parents. So I wouldn't direct that, but, but you know, I think um, I have two questions. One is, what everybody wants to know is, do we have an issue at Neshoba? That's one. And two is, if we do or we don't, I think if parents aren't aware, we should make them aware just to let them know what's happening and what's going on because I'm sure most parents don't know yeah. about this. There's some really good articles too like our nurse leader sent around an article that was really really good today and Brian Cody sent another article around today so I think you know as a staff we're, we're acutely aware of it. Um, but but we doesn't matter I mean it just no. it matters in the schools but I think no, you gotta go where it yeah. starts I mean not where it starts that didn't sound right you gotta go to the parents they should be made aware of what's happening but do we have a problem in the school? 
A lot of this is handled at the administrative level. I mean, if Mr. Cody goes into the bathroom and sees a pop of smoke, he's going to take that kid aside. He obviously is able to search his backpack, whereas I go off of probable cause, he's at, able to go off of reasonable suspicion. Um, Mr. DiDomenico, I don't know if you want to jump in and talk about sure. uh, how you guys handle it on the admin end. Well, I, just to, to answer your great Thank question, you. Lorraine, I mean, as Tina said, I mean, teenagers are going to be uh, pushing the envelope, looking for that next thing. So it's, it's, I think it's a problem at schools throughout the area and throughout the state. And the principals I speak to are all wrestling with this, with this same issue. Um, I don't know that it's, um, it, based on the information I have, I think it's, um, from what I've seen, it's a small group that's doing maybe a lot of vaping. Uh, as opposed to uh, widespread use, uh, you know, among among the whole student body, uh, at least in terms of uh, the, the principals I talk to in my own experience on our school grounds. Um, so I think it's it's a concentrated but uh, but intense usage among a small group. I think the message though is that we want the kids to know that we're going to be taking care of it. We're going to be yep. dealing with it. Absolutely. Perfect. Thank you, Lynn. Um, I'm reading what is in the uh, high school handbook. And is there a consequence? Do you just take it away? I mean, what's, is there a consequence? Yeah, there is, and it, it, uh, it uh, you know, with each offense, it gets, uh, it gets uh, uh, more pronounced, so that there are everything from, you know, you're, you're having, not only you're taking the device away, but there are consequences such as detentions, you know, possible if it, if it continues, it uh, may lead to other things. Certainly there's communication with the parents, and that's the most important piece of it. Uh, is that you're bringing the parents in, you're sitting them down, because we also know that this is not an isolated behavior in most in most cases. I mean, if a, if a student is doing this in school, chances are there's going to be other behaviors that are that are also uh, red flags that uh, that you want to speak to parents about. So there's a, there's something in the high school handbook, but this, from what I'm hearing from you talking, it's also junior high too. So do we have a district policy as far as any of this goes? Well, I think what one of the things that we're looking at doing is revamping and reviewing all of that because actually where this started was in our middle school. That's what led to all of this was in middle school. So, um, so we're we're uh, acutely aware of that as well. So, are we going to be looking for a recommendation from uh, the NES? Well, the NASC, yeah. NASC, yeah. And then so we're going to have our own district wide as well as the high school. Yeah, we need something. Right we we need something district wide. Okay. Yeah. I am, and I, I don't remember which letter it is. Do, does the NASC have? They do, and theirs was, if I'm remembering correctly, um, from our, there was a couple of policy meetings ago and we reviewed this one, but um, theirs was more up to date than ours because it had been updated mm -hmm. more recently and mm -hmm. it mentioned by name specifically, you know, vaping, vaping and yeah. everything else as opposed to just more of a broader, you can't Yeah, smoke. because ours is kind of, it's, yeah. So, yeah, Susan would, would be able to tell you off the top of her head because she's got a whole Rolodex in there of exactly which letter it is. So at your next but policy meeting, can you? Yep. We'll look at it again, but I remember we looked at it and said the MASC one was much more comprehensive in mm -hmm. really listing current. out every Good. single option um, and much more current with awesome. the technology. Thank you so much. Yeah. Let, let, let me know. So um, two quick things. Um, my concern is following on your split on the THC um, additive because my understanding is that's odor free um, and that that may find its way into the high schools. It hasn't um, for kids to be using. And is that an issue that you're seeing and how are you, how are you addressing that in relation to I mean, electronic pen versus per that? Yeah, that's a that's a great question, Neil. And I think that you know, as as someone just said, you know, things are changing so quickly. So I think everybody's trying to trying to figure out the best way to wrestle with that. You know, you've got to make quick decisions on things. And um, you know, at, at at the moment, I mean, you know, at that at that moment, we're not chemists. You know, and and, and so you're trying to kind of uh, factor in all the variables uh, in, in order to make a decision. But it's something that uh, all administrators across the area are wrestling with. When is it something that's you know? Akin to a to a cigarette, and when is it something that's akin to uh, marijuana? That's a, that's the, that's it's a great question, and we're still wrestling with it. I think something else you might want to consider also is just the uh, nature of addiction. That these things are all products of addicting substances. So um, when we were meeting before, the school nurse was here. That we really re we always try to recommend recommend that people. Uh, 
have the kids see the school nurse or um, who many school nurses are trained in at least in tobacco treatment um, and cessation and that it's treated as an addiction so that they can help the kids that are addicted because they're using them because they're addicted mm -hmm. not just because they want to be annoying you know so that's the pro that's the real issue to how to get help for kids who are addicted so that actually ties into the second so in policy we've touched upon last year and the year before um, the, the equitable justice uh, yeah and that keeps getting dropped because it's so hard to deal with and i would love to see that it's not equitable what, I, I, what I, it's restorative restorative justice. Restorative, justice. restorative justice because um you know kids are in the sports program so that have a stake can lose everything whereas kids who aren't don't lose anything um and to the and that's sure, sure. that's rough yeah but that's yeah. that's the challenge right Okay, Kathy, one last yeah, one. Yeah, I was just curious about what information we got from the Youth Risk Behavior Survey relative to this type of behavior and, and the extent to which the topic was parsed down uh, because some of the topics relate to behaviors in school, behaviors outside of school. So um, what, I, and I, I don't expect anybody to know off the top of the head, but I'd be interested to know how our demographics break down around this. Mm -hmm. um, so if we could get that, I'm just trying to get into it. I think it went off. Well, I think that our nurse leader also met with them and we added some additional questions. We were able to add some additional questions to the next upcoming survey sure. related to that. And that came up at our administrative meeting as well. Okay. Tina, thank you so much thank for making for a me. second trip out when the uh, superintendent shared with us what your discussion was about. It was one of those, oh my gosh, we really need to know what's happening. Well, it's great that you're proactive and on top of things. And um, as I said, she has my contact information. You can get waiting <laughs> 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 so to see if I would notice. It yeah. happened before. Thank you. And to our SRO, Casey, thank you for everything that you do with those kids. And um, really appreciate the relationship you have with okay, the students and the staff. Thank you. I love being in there. Thank you Thank so you, much. Casey. All right, folks, um, we now have an executive session. So for those of you who came and stuck it out, thank you. And thank you for your comments. And thank you for your emails. And thank you for your interest. And um, so um, we'll see you um, at the next meeting if you'd like to come back. Thank you. All right. Will the executive session last all night, or is there other business that will be discussed? Well, if you look at the agenda, we've got an executive, I can't believe I'm doing this. We've got an executive session, and it's going to be about 20-something minutes. We've got a couple of other items to go through, and then we've got another very long executive session we're anticipating. So but between 7.30 and 8.05, there will not be executive session, according to the agenda? We'll be coming back to the this room. Yes. Okay. So, so if you'd like to come back, then you can. can Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Executive like session. Okay. Like we'll see session. you in a bit. Yeah. executive session. Okay, I move that we enter into executive session to return yes. to the, yeah, yeah. I'll All right, I'll do it. Executive session pursuant to MGL uh, Chapter 30A, 21A2 to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with non-union personnel or to conduct collective bargaining sessions or contract negotiations with non-union personnel. Unit A contract negotiations. We will return to open meeting. Thank you. Second. second Thank Mark. you, Mark, second. for the second. Okay. Uh, Lorraine. Yes. Elise. Yes. Stephen. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Lynn. Joe. Mark. <coughs> Jones. <Yes>. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Kathy. Yes. Neil. Yes. And Susan is absent. And to include Amber and Mike. 
and to include in Lorene Stoica and, Stoica and Mike Carl. Mike, Mike is what I was going to say. Hi, Carl. Yes. Thank you.
again. We got a long night ahead of us. Okay. All right, we're good. We're returning to open session at 7:47. Well, I am absolutely thrilled to announce that um, the Shelby Regional School Committee has unanimously voted to ratify a new three-year contract with the Neshoba Regional Education Association Unit A member. This is largely made up of our teachers. We are absolutely so grateful to the Teachers Association um, and the folks that were in the bargaining committee, including um, Al Floriani, who led the charge, President of the Union, Kevin, I always mess your name up, Kevin. You got it. Thank you. Um, and there were several other people. The discussions were respectful. The discussions were rich. Um, the discussions were also um, very collegial. So um, I think the value of the contract, it will be, it should be online by the end of this month. I think what that contract represents is a true respect for the teachers and the staff in this district. And I want to thank you guys again for, I mean, it was a long process, but it was a really important process for us. So thank you all very much. And I'm going to give you a copy of it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. For everything. Yeah, appreciate it. Thanks, Thank you. Alrighty. We're moving into um, old business now. Um, new business. I have no old business. We have a Neshoba Regional High School calendar change. I think um, Principal Dean Domenico um, has a letter in your packet and because that um, late start on March 28th was one of the, how many do we have this year, nine or 12? Nine. nine. Yeah. Um, because it was already on the um, calendar, we have to vote in order for it not to come on. Right. However, I'd like if he could, we could bring Principal Domenico forward sure. to un help people understand that we're not just taking away this day and why are you requesting it? The, uh, the day in, in, uh, in question, the March 28th, is also an NCAS and ELA MCAS day. Um, so we can't put students in a position where they've got a late start and they're taking the test at the same time. So um, our teachers have been doing great work with the, uh, the late start days. They're, um, at some point in the future, we hope to share some of what's being done with you. Um, but clearly, we've got to put, uh, we've got to put that test first. So. So we need, um, any questions on this before we um, ask for a vote? Um, who wants to give me that vote, Kathy? I will move that we vote to allow the um, high school schedule um, to be changed on March uh, 28th, the second day of the grade 10 ELA MCAS. It's currently slated for a late start day, but um, uh, I move that we allow it to run on a regular schedule. Thank you. In a second? second. Elise. All those in favor? Unanimous? Thank you. Thank you for coming Thank in. I appreciate you That's waiting cool. on us. Um, okay. We've got a preliminary look at the FY1893 budget. So Pat Maroney, our business manager, is going to share some information with us. And we're going to ask Michelle Cody to come up as well uh, today, Chairman Romasco. Michelle is uh, critical in, in the work that we do to build this. She is our go-to person to pull all the numbers together and such, and she is really apparently second. Uh, so she's here to, uh, to help too. So um, you all can see it on your um, Chromebooks in front of you. Um, as we um, have got done the first pass of the budget, um, I just want you to know that uh, we have submissions from all the schools uh, and all of our programs, and we have some tweaking to do, but we have come forth with a 6.99% increase. <coughs> 
from last year. And um, I have some explanations about um, some of the increases as they appear here. So um, can I stop you for a second? Sure. Because I want to make sure that people understand that not all the information is in. We don't have all of it. It is, um, it was the school committee's request to try to accelerate a view of the budget. And even though we don't have that information, what you're looking at isn't complete. It, it's the first, not even real, full pass. Mm -hmm. And last year when we did the first not even real pass, we were at eight point something, weren't we? Right, that's correct. So, okay, we're moving in the right direction. Okay. There's one thing just to start yeah. off too that we need to plan. So, because we, there's, <coughs> if you look at the top box there, mm -hmm. it says decrease uh, both in dollars and decrease in percentage. There's mm -hmm. no parentheses around those numbers. Oh. So, there are actually increases uh, that are in there, so just mm -hmm. so it doesn't right okay. confuse. Sorry. But the way, because there's no, no, there's no parentheses around them. Mm -hmm. So, just so people understand that it would be a parenthesis with a decrease. Okay. Great okay. suggestion. So um, going down the line, as you can see, um, salaries for existing personnel, um, this a significant increase there, 6.99%. Um, we had some reductions in um, insurance and benefits, and I'll speak to that um, at length when we go over the detail. And there were reasons why it, it appears that there is that much of a reduction in that line. Um, moving down, and special education, we have some um, challenges about uh, new moving students and um, um, projected increases in tuition costs and also um, a, a reduction in our circuit breaker for that year and in my on my next slide I'll go into the circuit breaker in a little bit more detail um, facilities um, included in this is the hundred and fifty thousand dollars for the leaching field replacement and <coughs> a, some significant um, scheduled maintenance that needs to be done in, in next year. And also included in this is uh, we moved the telephone line from the technology budget to the facilities budget so that um, that would represent an increase as well. Um, in the utilities budget, um, we have not. Um, come up with offsets to all of the programs yet so like I said this is the first pass that's, that's a little bit more involved to determine how much we would offset in those areas does anybody have any questions about anything else that's up there again I just want to uh, echo what uh, Chairman Moscow was saying this is a snapshot in time exactly right now effective tonight and I remember saying this last year too, by tomorrow morning things could start to change. Yes. So it's really critical. I, I appreciate Chairman Ramosco's comments earlier. This is first pass right now. Right. And a lot of this information, the state hasn't even given us any estimates on what it's going to be yet. So yeah. um, and you know, so moving forward, the next slide is the revenue slide. Just some of the concerns I think as much as anything. Right. So um, revenue sources impacted by reductions in funding. So chapter 70, I haven't put any um, projection in yet. I, I don't have any numbers from the state. And the same thing for the regional transportation. Circuit breaker, we're looking at $113,699 reduction in funding for next year. <coughs> They've reduced. Um, the 75% reimbursement uh, of, um, it's the state average per pupil foundation budget that they base this this uh, amount of money on. And I can go into that a little bit further if you want. I don't think you need to. Okay. I think just give the, the overarching. Okay, um, school choice. This is um, a year um, in fiscal year 19. We have this year 23 school choice seniors that will be graduating so there's a significant <coughs> drop in the school choice um, E and D I put a number in uh, what I think is what we in you know in the direction that we want to go as far as Brooke has spoken many times about this about trying to get us off that wheel uh, I've reduced it 
Whether or not it stays there, I don't know. Going forward, um, I think this is just, like I said, a preliminary money. Um, charter school, um, I project that there will be um, a reduction in um, funding for that relief as well. And then to address some uh, other issues that we have um, in as far as grants, this year we uh, lost this SPED program improvement grant, which represents almost $28,000 to the district. And we brought that up last meeting. That's right. the same number that you saw last but meeting. But it's good to go over yeah. these two. Mm -hmm. and then, Thank and, you. And then again, continue the, we still don't have any kindergarten enhancement grant money that every year that we don't get that that's still that's still a loss, a loss that we have loss. to figure out every year for kindergarten that sixty thousand dollar loss and this year um just so you know we recognized a a five thousand dollar loss in our sped idea grant we're hoping that's not a trend for um 2019 so this is I have so, far. so this is just a snapshot to, you know, we're talking, uh, Pat and I were talking about revenues, and it's really difficult, as you said earlier, to even project revenues right now. We just have no idea. It's so early because, of course, the house numbers aren't going to come through until sometime late next month, in the month of January. But we already know that these are losses. So these are losses that we know are going to happen. And so we mm -hmm. wanted to put it out there. So that, that just kind of gives you an, a snapshot of where, where our thinking is right now. Um, school choice. You're you're talking about the the school choice kids that are here now that are leaving, but I n I never saw the school choice as a revenue maker or anything. I always thought it was as an offset to the kids that were actually school choicing out. So would it make more sense to say, okay, we've got so many choicing out and so many choicing in, and this is the difference? And that's where we lose it? But they're really different animals though, to be honest with you. I I think that would get I understand how this kind of looks confusing. Not really being yeah. tra you're not really being transparent when you're doing that if you're not telling people this is what it costs you <coughs> and this is what you're getting. And I think that's why this has to be on a revenue and expense but, line. But the way they're using it is 23 are leaving because they've graduated. So, or for whatever reason, 23 are leaving, and that's the loss. And I'm like, how is that a loss if we've... we've it's a loss of revenue. It's a loss of revenue for us, yeah. But it's also, I mean, if we're... Are we... We also have kids that are choosing out to other schools, right? And so I always thought that we were taking school choice in <coughs> to offset the kids that were school choosing out. So it was a wash. No, no, I don't, I don't think that that's ever been the mm -hmm. case. It's they're two totally different, totally different, and, and that's why. So, so school choice has always been a revenue issue. No, it, it's always been a revenue source for the district, and when we discontinued school choice. The slowly but surely every year we, the so numbers more drop off. Yeah. The as far as the expenditure side, like when we are having to pay for kids to go out, that that could vary in any given year, um, depending on the number of kids that choose to to go out. So very different things. Very different. different. And in the past, Lynn, it's been um, you know school choice has been five thousand dollars coming into the right. districts right for the student, and, and the question the question has been. That's not been the comparison because it's not fair. The question is, what is the five thousand coming in? What is the real cost for us to educate the student coming in at five thousand dollars? Are we hiring more teachers? Are there more classrooms? Is there more space? And then no, there's, there's a big ball of wax that was involved. Yeah. I get that, but that's not reflected yet because she's only doing the number of students by five thousand dollars. So we we have so many kids here times five thousand. Well, well right, friend, we're gonna this shut is this an down for right That's now because I think we've gone somewhere I'm not sure where, and I, I think to be respectful to you, put it in writing, and we'll get Pat to give you an explanation. Sure. That that'll give you the information you need, folks. I just I just have a question. If you're not getting the money this year, how can you say it's a loss for next year because you just you can't if you, if you're not seeing the revenue this year, you can't carry the lo the loss of let's say you last year you got a hundred thousand this this year you only got fifty thousand. You that's a loss for this year. You can't take that loss again for another year. It's not really right. But that the only one that that's really applicable to is that sixty thousand. Everything else is brand new. 
I, I get your point totally. Uh, uh, our point, though, with the sixty thousand, though, just to be clear, is that every single year we are going to have to figure that out because a program costs so much money every year to run a K program, and so that means that. And there hasn't been anything. There hasn't been anything come that's come back in to fill in that hole, right? And you, you no, don't I know from year I to year. I understand that, but yeah. you, it's not. If you didn't have it this year, it's not a loss from this year to next year. No, I understand what you're saying. But, but we, uh, yeah. we budgeted last year, or in the current year that we're in right now, assuming we would get that money, and we didn't. We didn't. Okay. So oh, that's where that, it's a problem. That yeah. makes more sense. Does that so was our free for us? So that makes more sense to me, Neil. Yeah, no, I agree with Steve. I mean, you can't take it from year to year. Right. I mean, you, you get the hit once, um, you know, it, and you can say we applied for the grant and we didn't get it, but we can't, we can't use we this lost revenue because it, we didn't have it, to mm -hmm. Steve's point. But if it's what you're talking about, that we had the grant and then we lost the grant. That's a, that's Maybe a different right. we it to the grant. Right, now it needs to reflect. If we, we budgeted for the grant, we should show that as a loss this in fiscal year 18. Right. Not, and can't carry it forward to fiscal year 19. Right. Right, no, you're, um, you're right if that's the scenario. And, and again, this right. is not a grant that we lost for whatever we did. This is a grant that the state's not giving anybody. They, well, they're pulling it from right. us. They pulled it. Now, we don't know if something else will reappear. Um, we just have to assume that it's gone. But it's it's gone across the state. It's not just gone for us. Correct. Okay. That particular one. Yes. Mark, Mark, that's that's question. Question. I'm curious if you can say what you anticipate the um, excess and deficiency fund amount will be at the conclusion of fiscal 17. It's the proposed amount that you sent to the state. Um. Uh, I. Anticipate that it will be about 1.6 million, and I don't have a certified. We don't have a certification on that yet. Right. Great. So okay. Thank you. Okay. Sorry. Which kind of ties in with the number that you see here, right. so right. you can see where our thinking was going there. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? I'm just going to yeah. piggyback on Steve's thing because <coughs> uh, if you follow the asterisk down below, it says the grant was limited in FY17. <coughs> For the uh, SPED improvement uh, program improvement grant, also, and if that's the case, then Steve's absolutely right. It shouldn't right. be reflected in the FY19 for a uh, for a loss. I think the intent of this was to say, just so you know, this is these are the, the deficits that we're working with right now. I think that was really the primary purpose to say these are the areas that we've lost sure. substantial money in. that one of the reasons that we see them there is that they have been there over the last few years. Right. And then it's a loss. Or That's exactly right. Yeah, so it was something that, that kindergarten was sort of like depend on. You, you can depend on it. That's right. exactly right. And now, also, mm -hmm. and no different with that twenty eight thousand yeah. dollars that sure. we've had for a year, and then all of a sudden, like well, two weeks ago, you're not getting it. You know, and that was a case where other school districts did, but we didn't. Do you know what they based them on? Well, well, it, well, it, it was a whole shift. They a, a whole shift of how they were going to. Um, distribute that money and it really was intended for level three and four and five schools and school districts mm -hmm. rather than us but that was a decision made in the last like four weeks so again that's one of those pockets where we were expecting it and mm -hmm. didn't get it mid-year I'd rather be level one me too okay the last thing I have it because we're kind of taking soft steps into this um, can is it possible for chapter 70 uh, to be explained and circuit breaker to be explained so anybody that the three people that are watching would actually be able to figure out what what See, it is when they look at that. Well, aside already. from the people here, um, you know, the folks at home. Um, you want to explain it? Yeah, so what is chapter 70? So we said chapter 70, they haven't talked about that at the state. What is that? What does that mean to us? And then circuit breaker, I mean, I know what they mean, but if you could explain just for the benefit of the people that might be looking at this. Well, it's it's really it's an in-depth calculation. Really complex. That 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 it, takes, is. it takes wealth in a community in, into account. Um, the number of kindergarten students that you have, the number of um, well, a num the number of students that you have. It's 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 really it's complex. Really and it's complex. Really complex. And mm -hmm. I, I you know I can put something up if you'd like that shows goes through the entire uh, calculation 
but it, it's, it's extremely involved. I don't. I it's, think I need about an hour. It's the money that we get from the state, though, when they right. vote on the budget and they vote on what Chapter 70 funding is going to be, and exactly. it's the thing that keeps every year keeps getting dropped. But then they, some people step forward, they fight, they renegotiate, bring it right. back up. But it's been in this flux. So. Right, it has been in this flux. Oh. And every year, we never know what really what it's going to be until they come up with that final number. It could be higher, could be a little bit lower. And the number we'll get in January could change three or four times between January and July or August. Right. So it, it's a number that's always in flux. Right. And I apologize. I wasn't ask, asking for the exact form. Like oh, every yeah. Single it's, it's item. So but just to I mean, explain just to people what Chapter 70 is. So, so people in the budget book, it says it. the Chapter 70 program of state aid to public elementary and secondary schools, in addition to providing state aid to support school operations, it also establishes minimum spending requirements for each school district and minimum requirements for each municipality's share of school costs. Uh, and then also circuit breaker that, that's involving SPED, so the fact that we're losing or we're getting hit with the circuit breaker. Right, and that's also based on the foundation budget and um, the, the Department of Education assigns an adequate but not excessive spending level for the district. Um, and, and I think she's got it right here that so she can just pull it up. So in the budget book, I swear this budget book is just so valuable. Um, the budget book in the glossary, it says circuit breaker, is special education, and Joan probably could have jumped in and told us this, out of district placement relief from mm -hmm. the state. Funds are received in year one and must be expended in the following year. All of the previous year's funds must be expended. So it's relief from the state to help us with our large <coughs> out-of-district placement right. needs for the kids who have significant need. Does that make sense? That's, That's correct. That's absolutely correct. Typically, do I understand it correctly? Typically for the year after. So this year we had mm -hmm. students that entered the, the district. Mm -hmm. We're not necessarily going to get reimbursed immediately on this particular budget for those individuals, but the no. next budget cycle we will Always a year we're working out. on the year right. after. So that's because that'll be questions people are asking too. If we're losing money, how come they're not replacing it at the state level? Right, that's absolutely right. right. And just remind people that the budget book is online. The budget is book it? is online on the, uh, in the finance tab on the district site by year, and you can find the full budget there as well. Okay, are we good, folks? Yes, ma'am. Okay, um, correspondence. I think. Uh, that's it. Thank you. We, thank, thank you, ladies. You. We have all received a good amount of correspondence on the pre-K program, and I think I announced at the beginning of the meeting, we're gonna have the administration create a document to be able to distribute to the communities to help people understand what what's being done, why, and what the implications of it are. Um, if there's any other correspondence we need to be made aware of, let me know what. Will that fall in line with the announcements about the registration and all that stuff that the parents need to be aware of in order to get their kids registered? I would assume... Yeah, we've actually started that and, and uh, Joan can certainly um, just add in to... We've sent the paper, the first paperwork for pre-K out today. So yes. that, that's gone out because we, we are almost at a standstill now until we get information back from parents mm -hmm. for both pre-K and K. So uh, the K was a little bit different discussion, um, and I know that the principals felt like we could kind of felt at a standstill the other day when we were talking about this and said, until we see the numbers now from the communities, we need to, we work at a standstill for what we can do next. So that's why we're hoping that most of that paper will, will be pulled together. And I know that Joan has been working on a chart <coughs> bringing that information in. So we'll have whatever, again, the snapshot as of December 20th of where we're at with that. Okay, so I just want to make sure that what you're doing dovetails with what they need to do. So we believe it does. Okay. And so I read somewhere in, in the emails that there was a meeting scheduled. The principals? Uh, there's there's no another meeting with for the us. Parents. And, the, and the question was, what is that meeting for? What, I don't think that's, so no, that's, I, don't know that, that I referenced is. that earlier. There's a, there's a group of parents that oh. are gathering. I don't know oh, where. It to do with this. I don't know when. No, it doesn't no. have anything to do with us. Oh, you didn't Although I will say to those who are organizing it, please do invite. I know, it would help. Several <laughs> of the school committee members or the administration there so that questions that can be answered are answered and the information's accurate and 
then we get the information and bring it back to the administration, but let us know. Okay. So I was misinformed. I thought it was something you did. All right, Neil. I, I want to go off um, Lynn's. So when are we going to get recommendations from the uh, administration with regards to fee structure again so that there's no... Because it my understanding is we have to vote on that annually regardless mm -hmm. whether there's I believe that's on the uh, the uh, January agenda but in fact I know it is I think it's the first meeting in January and we've asked Tanya to come back because you've asked her you sent her off to do some things and she's doing that uh, she's I'm sorry for he's talking about yeah pre K and K okay. so that, so again yeah, that athletics. no no, no, no. 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 But that's that's on the radar too. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that one's January third. That's January third. That but yeah. athletics, that, but pre K and K. Pre K and yeah. K. I don't. I don't. When are you bringing that? Just in? to make we, sure that dovetails again yeah. in with this registration. We can bring that. We don't right. need to bring that forward as well. Yeah. So okay. we'll bring that forward to the December twentieth meeting. Okay. Thank you. All right. Anything else? Um, your. Oh no! I'm sorry. I just. <laughs> How long, when do parents have to have all their paperwork in? I think that uh, Joan, the deadline is, I think the, the just for the Thank uh, you. It was for the holidays. So it's just for the meeting. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, but can, and when is kindergarten? Is that after the meeting? I think it's December 20th. I think so too. I'm the 21st. It's between the 18th So and is the, the paperwork for the 18th, is that it? Like I want a spot to be in? Which, yeah, what are you interested in? But there's well, no fee. There, if there, <coughs> we haven't discussed fees, no. But we'll bring that to you on the trial. Just to make sure there's no paperwork. Yeah. Okay. So it, just to, so the the school committee calendar, which is online mm -hmm. and is flu, it's flu, you know, it flu yes. fluid because it changes. Yeah. yeah thank you. Um, that's online, and so everything that we discuss is pretty much there, and the timeline it pretty much it's going. And it's still changing. This itself. is this is updated every single meeting. Every it's meeting. available to public. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's, it's been there since okay. it changes every year. Early September. Yeah. Just want to make sure the public can get it. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm taking a lot of pride in this darn thing. I, know you are. <laughs> I just yeah. want to make sure it's out there. Back and back to the fee structure thing, because if we have a deadline of the 18th yeah, and the other one right. of the 21st, and we're making a vote on the 20th, that means we are voting after the closing time again for pre-K, and we're a day before the closing. Yep. If we vote that night for kindergarten, which again is so committing people, and they don't know how well, much communication is. should clearly say that rates are subject to they do. adjustment. Yeah, they do. But but that's a, a separate issue from what I think you're you're. Yeah. So last year, I think we had tried to commit to but, just but I establishing it. So in that all it didn't honesty, it, it, there should be a message right now about the fact that we have not brought anything with huge changes to forward at this point in time. Huge changes, but it doesn't say no changes. I know. All right, just to make sure it's clear. It doesn't say no changes. Alrighty. We're moving yeah. on. Neil, what's the matter? I popped back up. Oh, all all right. excited <laughs> the thing, and there we go. All right. Yeah. Um, consent agenda will assume that the meeting minutes of November 29th and uh, warrants of December 18th and 8th um, 2017 are good to go. Excuse me? Yeah, I think he's doing great minutes. Thank you. Okay. And, um, and the, we just talked about the items to be considered for next agenda. And at this point, we are going to move into another executive session. Mm -hmm. So for those of you who won't be here. We have to make the motion. We will. Yep. Um, well, as soon as we take the vote, we'll ask you to, well, first, thank you for coming and sticking it out. And then um, we'll ask you to run, run like the wind. Mm -hmm. um, you want to include Mike Maccaro. Okay. And Anne-Marie. And Anne-Marie and Brooke. And Joan DeAngelis. And our superintendent. Our sitter. Okay. Can I move that we adjourn the regular session and enter into executive session pursuant to MGL Chapter 30A, 21A2 to conduct strategy session in preparation for negotiations with non union personnel to conduct, conduct collective bargaining sessions or to contract negotiation or contract negotiations <coughs> with non union personnel BCBA realignment grievance. Um, the committee will adjourn the executive session and the executive 
um, uh, session will include uh, District Council Mike Maccaro, um, HR Director Marianne Stryker, and Anne Marie. Marie Stryker. I didn't have it written that way. Marianne's <laughs> <laughs> my daughter. <laughs> and Superintendent Pledge. And, and Joe DeAngelis. And Joe DeAngelis, Special uh, PPS Director. Second. Okay. All right, thank you, Mark. Okay, yes. Marling, Elise? Yes. Steve? Yes. Lynn? Yes. Mark? Yes. Kathy? Yes. Neil? Yes. Okay. Good to go? Uh, yes. All right. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.